recording started. Uh, and I remember now, uh, any kids for Kids Church, uh, now is the time uh, Jessica is taking the kids if they want to go to Kids Church. All right, let's get to the text. Uh, Matthew 16, from verse 13 to 19, we read. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give the keys of the kingdom, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Before we get into the sermon, let us pray that we may understand God's word. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you have not left us in the dark, to fumble about, not knowing who we are, not knowing what to believe, not knowing how to live. But yet you have spoken clearly to us. Lord, we pray that as we listen, that our hearts may be like fertile soil. That as your word is scattered abroad, it may find fertile soil so that it may grow into fruit in our lives. Lord, we pray that we may not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this morning's sermon is primarily going to be focusing on Matthew 16 and from verse 18 to 19, but the rest is sort of what we're going to be looking at as, as context around it to help us understand what is going on there. The title of the sermon this morning is Hope for a Small Church in a Big World. And the reality is, and why I've titled it this way, is that we live in a time in history where the church feels small, feels fragile, can feel weak, insignificant, and even irrelevant. We live in a time where it feels like so much of the church is polluted with irreverence, a love of money, and a capitulation to the culture. And here is the reality. We can become so petrified, so afraid, that what little we have will be lost, that we never risk anything. We never dare to imagine that we could build something greater. Rather, we sit in a corner out of fear, protecting the little that we have because everything outside of us makes it feel like the church is so fragile. We start playing defense and focusing our efforts on protecting the church from being captured by the culture, protecting the church from all these outside influences. And I think the reality is that we do not just feel this way about the church as this larger international institution. But we can often come to feel that way even about our own church, our own congregation. We don't have a 200 year old denomination with deep pockets that is always there to catch us. We are in a time of transition where we are in search of a new suitable replacement for our senior pastor. And so often in these times of uncertainty, these times where it feels fragile, we can start to let fear take control and lead us on to go on the defensive and focus all our efforts on preserving the little that we have rather than building something glorious. And at the point of the sermon this morning and what I want to look at in this text is an encouragement to us, brothers and sisters, to remind us that though it feels 
like we are small. And we live in the shadows of these greater powers of darkness. The reality is they are but small, little, pathetic, fragile things. And compared to our God, they are like a candle next to the sun. So from this text, what I want to do is I want to look at three wonderful truths about God's church. That it is not a small, fragile thing to be coddled and protected. No, it is a glorious, triumphant, advancing and ever conquering thing that the world cannot break. So let's get to the text. Let's look at what our Lord has to say about his church. We're going to, as I said, move quickly from verse 13 to verse 18, where we'll spend most of our time looking at verse 18 and 19. A passage begins with Jesus um, asking his disciples, Who do the people say that I am? Jesus has been busy doing all these miracles, ministering and preaching around the Sea of Galilee. And rumors are running rampant. Who is this man? What is he doing? And so Jesus asks his disciples to tell him about these rumors. What do the, who do the people say that I am? Some say he's John the Baptist. Some think that he is one of the prophets come back. Some think he's Jeremiah. But after this, Jesus goes to his disciples, okay, well, this is what these people out there say. This is what those who do not know me well think that I am. But then he turns to his disciples, you, you who have been with me side by side in the depths of my ministry, you who have my private instruction, who do you think that I am? And Simon Peter, most, most likely answering on behalf of all the other disciples, says, you are the Christ. The Son of the Living God. In verse 17, Jesus replies that this knowledge that Peter has, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Christ means Messiah. This knowledge is not something that Peter just came to through a great amount of logical deduction. He didn't just look at all the facts and come together and say, oh, this is the reality. No, Jesus says, this is not something that has been given to you by flesh. It has been given to you by the Father. It is a revelation from God given to Peter. And then in verse 18, Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, which means stone. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So looking at that first part of verse 18, the first wonderful truth I want us to be reminded about is that the church is built on a firm foundation that cannot ever be shaken. What the Roman Catholics will do is they will take this passage and they will say, well, this is teaching us that Peter and those who are his successors are the rock on which the church is built. So the Pope is the rock on which the church stands. But nowhere in this passage did Jesus have anything to say about Peter's successors or anything along these lines. Nor does Jesus ever elevate Peter here above all the other apostles. And this is why we don't read passages in isolation. We don't just read this one thing and draw all our conclusions from it. But we allow scripture to interpret scripture. We allow the Bible to interpret the Bible for us. The best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. So we read that in that verse, those verses in Ephesians, what Paul has to say about this. Paul makes it clear that the household of God, the church, is built on what foundation? The foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. The testimony of the Old Testament prophets looking forward to the Messiah to come. And the testimony of the New Testament apostles looking back at the Messiah that has come. That is what forms the unbreakable foundation of the church. Peter and his confession that Jesus is Messiah forms the solid rock that stands at the church's foundation. Just to sort of bring it all together so you sort of understand what I'm saying. The prophets and apostles, this is a way of speaking of all of the scriptures. So what Paul is saying and what Jesus means when he is speaking to Peter here is that the foundation of the church is not man. But it is the testimony, the revelation of God to the people of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The foundation of the church is the scriptures, the Bible, the living word of God. 
The foundation of the church is not a man-made thing, but it is a God-inspired thing. And this foundation cannot ever be shaken. For over 2,000 years, this foundation has been attacked, critiqued, and assaulted from every side. But for 2,000 years, it has stand, stood unbroken. Empires have risen and fallen, yet the foundations of the church, the Word of God, remains uncracked, unbroken. So let us take heart that the church is not built on sand, but it is built on the rock. And when the current political opinions of our time that seem so powerful have faded into obscurity a hundred years from now, the foundation of the church will remain. When today's scientific facts have been revised and replaced by new ones, the truth that forms the foundation of the church will still remain. The testimony of the prophets and apostles about the Lord Jesus Christ will remain the same. So again, the first point is that the church has a foundation that cannot be shaken, that cannot ever possibly be broken. We're going to jump to verse 19 and we'll get back to the gates of hell in a second to talk about what that means. Jumping to verse 19, we read that Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The second point, looking at verse 19, is that the church is powerful. It wields the keys of the kingdom. When we hear that at first, we may say, oh, well, great. We have armies in the world. They have tanks. They have bombs. They have swords. What do we have? Some keys. Whatever will we do with a set of keys? What kind of power is there really in a set of keys? Well, a bit. What kind of power do keys have? Think about it this way. The one who has the keys has the power to exclude or to permit entrance. The Heidelberg Catechism, which we, um, this part of the Heidelberg Catechism we looked at a while ago, actually answers this question. Question 82 asks, asks, what are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Answer, the preaching of the holy gospel and Christian discipline or excommunication out of the Christian church. By these two, the kingdom of heaven is open to believers and shut against unbelievers. Our power is in the keys that we wield. Through the gospel, we are able to hold open and say to every repentant sinner that the gates of the kingdom of God is open to you. Enter in. We wield the only key, the only way into the kingdom of heaven. The good news that Jesus dies for sinners like you and me. We wield the only hope for a dark world. And that is no small power. And that is a power that the world cannot steal. And as the church has the power to proclaim those gates open, it has also been given the power to proclaim those gates shut. Through church discipline, we hold the power to shut those gates. To evil men who will not change their ways, who will not bend the knee to Jesus, the church through her leaders wields the power to shut the gates before them and say no. Unless you repent and believe the gospel, these gates are shut to you. And I fear that in the name of niceness, in the fear of that we will lose numbers or income, we do not wield this side of the keys. We let wolves run rampant among the sheep in the church today. And when we are ruled by fear, we will compromise. And our fear in much of the church in the world today is a fear that if we confront sin, then we will lose people.
And out of this fear, we will proclaim the gates of heaven wide open, even to those who have no love for Christ. The proper use of the keys is the exclusion, the excommunicating, and treating like an unbeliever those who are unrepentant sinners. And I'm going to say that five times faster that we get the reality. Unrepentant sinners. Unrepentant sinners. Unrepentant sinners. I think that's three. Unrepentant sinners. Unrepentant sinners. And that is extremely important because if we were just to excommunicate every sinner, we would be empty. You might as well excommunicate me as well then. We do not shut the gates in front of a broken hearted sinner, but the unrepentant. Before them, the gates of heaven is shut. Wielding the keys against those who are broken hearted is a wrong use of them. But here is the thing. It is far better. It is far better to exclude the truly unrepentant than to just say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Because if we do not do this, we will go on living in a church and in a world of the church where we come and go and say, uh, pretending that when someone is a Christian, well, they really aren't. It is unloving to tell someone with a real problem that you are fine. To say peace, peace, when there is no peace. To say all is good. When someone is living in clear rebellion against God, that is not loving. That is cowardice. And I don't stand here this morning as the paragon of bravery when it comes to confronting sin. I fail at this. Often. For those of you who know me, you know I don't like confrontation. But the reality is, if we are to wield these keys properly, we must confront sin. To truly love our brothers and sisters is not to turn a blind eye. It is to be honest. What it looks like practically though, is not calling the church council every time you hear a member saying a cuss word. Not at all. But to be living in relationship and honesty with one another to such an extent that if you see patterns in your brothers or sisters' lives, you have the courage, the confidence, and the relationship to approach them and say, Hey, not okay. We are called to be better. If we have families missing church for kids' sport or work, to not just turn a blind eye and say, Hey, we all need to be better than this. To turn a blind eye is not love. It is cowardice. The reason the church has been given this power as well is so that we may purge evil from our midst. And again, let it be clear, unrepentant evil. Not everyone who stumbles, but the one who persists in their sin and even when confronted has no remorse, loves it and will not stop it even at the admonition of a brother or sister in Christ. We have been given the keys, the power to proclaim those gates wide open and to proclaim them shut. And with this great power, it's a cliche, but comes great responsibility. Because if we use these wrongly, we will hurt people. To say to the truly broken hearted and repentant sinner, these gates are shut before you, is to misuse these keys and it is to do unthinkable damage. And in the same way, to go to the one who is unrepentant, living in their sin, and for not a care in the world for their sin, and to tell them, you're fine, you're good, God loves you the way that you are. To not confront them with their sin does equal damage because they will go to hell thinking that they are a good person. So we must wield these keys responsibly in both 
directions. May we never proclaim the gates shut to any who come to Christ repentant and in faith. But may we never proclaim the gates open to one who has no faith in Christ. May we be a church that does not offer false assurances. But may we at every point offer assurance to any who have faith in Christ. The church is powerful. We wield a power that no one else, no other institution in the world wields. And this is a power that cannot be stolen or shaken. The final point. The church is incorruptible and unstoppable. The very gates of hell will not prevail against it. Looking at that second part of verse 18. The world will never, ever be without a faithful church proclaiming the gospel. Jesus is the king of his church, the head of his body, and he will not ever let his body be completely corrupted or completely destroyed. Jesus is the good husband who will not let his bride be corrupted or destroyed. While congregations, denominations, nations and cultures and languages may come and go, the church as a whole will remain until the Lord returns. Again, as I said earlier, when we look around us, we see so much of the visible church that seems to be corrupt and compromised. We have ministers in pride parades, whole denominations calling what God calls an abomination beautiful. Whole Christian TV networks dedicated to false teachers calling themselves prophet to make a profit of people. And it can seem that if we are not constantly on guard, if we are not on the defensive, that the church would be wholly corrupted. And that's what the Mormons believe. They believe that somewhere in the first century, after the apostles, something went horribly wrong, the true Christian faith was lost, until a man named Joseph Smith found some golden tablets under a tree, and God revealed the truth to him again. But for that time, between the apostles and Joseph Smith, there was no church in the world. The church was wholly corrupted. That's what they believed. And I say it to you this morning, that that is utter blasphemy. Why? Because Christ is a good husband. He has made a promise that the powers of hell will not prevail against his bride. A good husband does not leave his wife to be corrupted or destroyed, but guards and protects her. So we do not need to be playing the defensive game, constantly scared that if we don't wrap the church in its little cotton wool, it may be destroyed. No. Because Jesus has our back. Because Jesus is the assurance that the church will not fail, we can be boldly on the offensive. Look again at verse 18. It says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I'm going to ask a stupid question so that you get the point with a rather obvious answer. Do you use a gate to attack or to defend? The obvious answer is that you use gates to defend, not attack. And the point that we see from that is that the person or the ones that are hiding behind the gate is not the church that is under attack from the powers of hell hiding behind our gates. No. The picture that we see in this passage is that the church, the kingdom of God, is on the advance, on the attack, moving forward. It is hell that is on the defensive, hiding behind its gates against the advance of the kingdom of God through the church. We are meant to be advancing, moving forward. Our mission, as I preached last time, is not to sit on our hands until Christ comes again. As David slays Goliath, he is followed by the armies of the kingdom who come and defeat the Philistines. This is the same picture Jesus has defeated our great enemy, sin, death, and Satan. And we are now to follow him to finish the battle. 
He has freed us from our change of sin. That left us powerless to fight back. He through his death has destroyed death. Through his death, he has overcome Satan. Satan has nothing to accuse us of anymore that Christ has not already dealt with. Satan's greatest weapon, which is death, has lost its sting. The advance of the gospel will not be stopped by the gates of hell. So let us take heart from this. Because of what Christ has done for us. Because he stands behind us. Let us remember that the church is built on a foundation that cannot be broken. That it has power that cannot be stolen. And that it will stand to the last day and its advance will not be stopped. Not because of us, but because of her husband, her head, Jesus Christ. So Lewis Winnie, as we stand here with 20 years behind us, let us remember those who came before us and let us honor our fathers and mothers in the faith. But as we stand here looking back at 20 years, let, we, let us also look forward to the next 20 years. Not fearful that we may lose this little that we have, but optimistic, determined, knowing that the Lord will use our labors to build His church. May our legacy, what we leave for our children, our grandchildren and their children, who grow up in this church, not be a compromised once a week cultural Christianity. May we leave them a Christian community that stands sure on the foundation of God's Word. A community whose leaders faithfully and rightly wield the keys of the kingdom for the joy and the purity of the church. May we leave them a community that is on the advance. A community that is growing through evangelism and through fruitful Christian households, bearing children and instructing them in the fear of the Lord. May we leave them a community that is not only growing in width, but in depth. Not for our glory, but for the glory of our King and the joy of His people. Amen. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you for 20 years. That every moment is a gift of grace. That every moment is goodness from your hand. Lord, may we not only look back, but may we look forward. Lord, I pray that you may give us a drive, a courage, a boldness, knowing that you have us safely in your hands so that we can advance. We do not need to play the defensive game, but we can be bold, going into the world, building something glorious for the generations to come. Lord, in all of this, may we not forget the gospel, that we are not loved or accepted by you because of our efforts, but because you have loved us, because you have freed us, because you have dealt with our greatest enemy. Now in gratitude, we follow you in your advance. Lord, may we not forget that your church is built on a strong foundation, that it wields power the world cannot, and that it will never be stopped. And may that give us hope for the next 20 years. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we now have a moment to take up the offering, and then we will stand and sing.